Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Introduction to Theater. Uh, I'm Wynne Moreno, and today we're going to be talking about the playwright. We're going right into our next module, which is more of a hypothetical theater and less of the literal uh, producing something on theater like acting and directing. Now we're getting to the more theoretical um, in the, the theater of the mind, in, in the play, uh, constructing the play, designing the play, so on and so forth. So I hope you enjoy this, this lecture. It's not going to be too long today. And uh, let's just get right into it. This is in chapter six in your book. And here's just a little joke that I, that I like to start out with. How many playwrights does it take to change a light bulb? I'm not changing anything, says the playwright. Uh, just a little joke on how some playwrights are, are pretty adamant on, on keeping their script to what they wanted to build in the very beginning. Um, they, they work really hard on making it interesting and exciting and taking their protagonists and their, their antagonists on this journey and they don't like directors and actors really screwing up that, that form, that storytelling element. So anytime a director says, hey, do you mind if we check, we check this line or we change this, uh, this little bit of dialogue to something, most playwrights will be uh, pretty reticent to say, yeah, that's fine. Or they'll, you know, they can, they can just say, you know what, I wrote it to be this way and I'm, I'm sticking to it. Uh, you'll find that's pretty consistent with a lot of playwrights. They're, they're particular about their words and their word choices. So let's go to basics and to just like what a storyteller is. Like what, what makes a playwright? Where do they start? They start with an inspirational thought, with something that, is, that has to do with what we're going through right now. So most playwrights who were around during the 1970s were writing things that were relevant to the 1970s, things that were going on in, in the 80s, the 90s, today. If you had to write a story that would appeal to audiences today, like what would the story be about? Would it be about Black Lives Matter? Would it be about this coronavirus that we're, we're currently going through? Would it be about, I don't know, anything? Uh, religion? Would it be about school, education? The things that you're, you're affected by are, are the things that you would start with. So you start with this inspirational thought and then you go on from there. You find the nugget. Uh, what my playwright teacher used to teach us is that like that little nugget of thought, um, the, the key of the play, the, the meat of the play, that's what we're trying to get at. And then they go on to create what's called a blueprint or story structure. And they spend most of their time figuring out which, um, which structure story beats are happening when and where. So when does your main character go on this adventure? When do they meet the wizard in the woods? When do they go on to, to save um, their family from disaster? You know, those kind of story beats take up most of the playwright's time. And then dialogue is just kind of sprinkled on top of it. Um, to just kind of make it come alive and to make sure that people like me and people in the industry called actors and directors can make it come to life. It's not like a novel. It's not like a magazine or a comic book. You have to make it for people to perform. So um, the definition of plot in your book uh, is, it says it's the order and events in a scene. Um, the specific order and the events in a scene. I want you guys to remember that because that will be on the test. Um, the pl that's what a plot is. The plot is not the main story. It's not what's, what we'd like to think of as the main story or the, um, you know, just the, the storyline. That is not what a plot is. The plot are the, is the specific order and events that happen in scene by scene by scene and they create the skeleton of the story. That's what a plot means. And just by, by the way, everything is recycled. Everything is used over and over again. There's not really like an original story anymore. It's just kind of like a retelling of something else that has happened before. And there are these, stro these story structures and these plot devices that are recycled and we make them fresh and new um, by putting a new lens on it because you have a very, um, a very interesting perspective. You know, like you, you see things through your own eyes and you tell your story very different than how I'm going to tell my story. And even if we're going to use the same plot structure, then it doesn't matter. That's because it's you and it's going to be different. 
Uh, in your book, it highlights that the word drama comes from the keyword, the Greek word dron, which means to act or to do. So keep that in mind because you guys will be writing a play or writing at least a scene in this class um, and think about moving it forward with what we call action. Remember when we talked about that in acting, in our acting lecture, that action makes things happen. Uh, it's what your characters do to get what they want. It's the same kind of thing when we're talking about playwriting. Um, we want to move the story forward through action. Nobody wants to read or perform a story about um, Grandma Hubbard going to the store and buying a loaf of bread. And then when she gets home, she makes a sandwich. You know, that's not very interesting. But what is interesting is when she gets to the store and then aliens attack the store or something like that. Something exciting, something to move the plot forward, something that will cause us to say, what next? What's happening next? It's an extraordinary situation, right? So keep that in mind when you guys are going to write something. Uh, here's a clip. Go ahead and uh, this is nothing new that you guys should be used to this. Go ahead and click the link in the description, the one that says The Godfather. Um, I hope you guys have never seen this before. I find this very interesting that a lot of my students haven't seen The Godfather before. Um, but go ahead and watch it and we'll, we'll come right back and discuss it. Okay, pause the video and come right back. See you soon. Okay, welcome back. Uh, awesome scene, right? Uh, I love this movie and I think pretty much that this is the best scene in the movie in my in my opinion it's the most exciting and it's the moment where we all we're all trying to figure out at the same time we're trying to go who's who what's what's up and what's down and who stands for good and who stands for whatever you know that's uh, our brains are trying to figure that out we're trying to say who is this man? Why is he wearing a tuxedo? Uh, who's he talking to? And why are we here? Why is this story important? Beginnings are everything in the theater and in movies. I really think they're, they're critical in capturing the audience's attention and getting us to keep going. So here's a, a copy of the script that I found online. Um, it, it has the full breakdown. I'm sure this isn't the first version of the script when it was written. Um, but you know, it's close enough. This is, this is what it en ended up being in the movie and someone has transcribed it to be this way. This is the basic, um, structure of what you guys, your scripts will look like when you go to write your story. So, um, we'll talk about that in a little bit, little bit later when we talk about Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross, but for now, just keep in mind, take a look at how this is, this is structured. There's a name right here in the middle and then underneath, is dialogue it kind of bunched together and then if you have some kind of action on stage action that kind of dramatic action the drawn that's happening um you can you can separate it as like a new kind of paragraph and in a different form some people like to put um dramatic action on the side over here on the right some people like to put it on the left it just depends on on your personal preference um, i like this structure myself and i like the font that they chose which is courier so if you guys wanted to choose that in your word processor or your Google Drive or however you guys are going to write these, um, that's a good, it's, it's, it mimics the, the copy um, of typewriting. It's like a typewriter made it. So I don't know, it's just kind of classic and it's what everyone uses. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, Bonacera comes in here and he starts talking about believing in America. And the first thing that we recognize is that he has an accent. And so he's not from here. And immediately we go, oh, this man is an immigrant. And he, he believes in America. He believes in American values. And he's talking about American traditional fashion um, and raising children in the American way, even though he's Italian right? So we all of a sudden we say, this is about Italian Americans. This is about this specific man. Um, and then he talks, he, he goes ahead and tells us a little bit of what's called exposition. And exposition is, is a term that you guys need to remember. Exposition is, is just the facts of the play. It's, it's given facts that are either spoken or they're told through action or flashbacks or whatever. So we can give exposition in a really clever way, um, or we can do it in a very boring, um, typical way. Uh, a bad form of exposition would be if Bonacera came in here and he says, I am an Italian American 
And I came here in 19, oh, whatever, or 18 something. And now I am here to talk to you, Godfather, about these specific things. But that doesn't happen. And here he talks about his daughter. And we have to kind of piece it together ourselves. That's good exposition. Anytime you make the audience kind of go on this journey with you, uh, that's clever exposition. And even better, when you can show it, when you can show it on screen, um, you know, him, him breaking down and being sad and taking a drink, uh, we're, we're all of a sudden, we're, we're playing it out on our minds about, okay, this, this, person is in, this person is important. Instead of Bonacera saying, you are very important, and I come here to ask a question. We already know that from the unspoken exposition that's given. He talks about going to the police, and then this man, Vito Corleone, which we don't know who he is. We end up finding out that he's the godfather. Um, he asks him, why didn't he come to him? And then the plot thickens. Then we realize that this man is outside of the law. He is not a, he is not a police officer, and he's not a, he's not a, a person in charge of anything. He's, he's a civilian, right? And it gets even more sinister as he talks about what he wants him to do and taking, taking um, vengeance. You're talking about vengeance and not, not justice. And then he calls him Godfather. And then we get the, the idea that this man is, is an important person, right? All of this is good. And we, we realize that this is, um, this is this man's livelihood. And he, he lives by values and customs that we are not, that we don't know. The, this is a different world than ours. And immediately we are interested and we want to keep going, right? Very good. This is one of my last, this is one of my favorite little parts where he says, um, uh, Bonacera, what have I ever done to make you treat me so disrespectfully? Had you come to me in friendship, then the scum that ruined your daughter would be suffering this very day. And that by chance, if an honest man such as yourself should make enemies, then they would become my enemies and that they would fear you. Um, this sounds like a psychopath that says this. If someone said this in real life, you'd, you'd be, uh, you'd probably be afraid of this person, <laughs> uh, very understandably scared of this individual. Um, but he also kind of stands for values and these interesting things that we, we end up kind of going, oh, this horrible thing happened to this woman and he is offering a form of justice. And that kind of like makes sense to us. So He's not altogether like a horrible person in our brains. That's what's happening. The, the way that this story is structuring and the way that it's, it's forming is trying to make us understand this weird perspective, this perspective that good is down and up is bad. You know, like we start forgetting what, what's moral and right or whatever, whatever your, your compass points that kind of messes with that during, during this. And I've seen that in media ever since this, um, but we see it all over. So let's talk about the meaning of the title. Um, this example is from The Crucible um, by Arthur Miller. And this is about the Salem witch trials in Massachusetts. And uh, this is just a university production of it right here. And you'll notice that this picture right over here um, is the crucible that they're referring to. This is, this, is, this is the name of the title. This has nothing to do with the plot or structure of the play. But the Salem witch, witch Trials are about, and the Crucible, the story of the Crucible by Arthur Miller is about the society that is under immense pressure and heat and that you must conform, you must, be, you must be managed in such a way that it feels like you are under this melting pot that creates um, molten hot metal. And it's creating whatever you need to make. It can make a tool or it can make a weapon of some kind. You can be formed by raw materials in this crucible. Um, and so it's, it's an analogy. It's this, this analogy of, um, or this allegory of this story is that this man, John Proctor, is, is formed and squished to be something else. Um, and is, he has to change. He has to change everything about himself to, to go through a lie, really, essentially, a lie to, to protect his wife. 
so it's all about Christianity and religion and, and um, this, the societal pressure that causes him to change everything about himself. Right. So here's another clip. Uh, this is from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And I just wanted to give you guys a little heads up on language at this point. I know I mentioned this at the beginning of class, but uh, there will be some language in this video. And if, you know, if you're, if you're not interested in, in watching this particular video, um, I highly recommend it, but it, it does have some foul language in it. If that bothers you, then go ahead and skip this. Um, but we're going to talk about it a little bit in this next section. So go ahead and pause the video, come right back, and we'll talk about it in more detail, okay? All right, welcome back. So <laughs> I know uh, Alec Baldwin was, is an interesting character in this script, and... Um, the one thing that I, the reason why I chose this, this clip to, to highlight writing and writing for the stage, um, this originally was a stage production. I wanted to highlight how a, how a playwright could write something on the paper that could lend itself to an actor. An actor could read these, these lines and, and put a character on. They can, they can understand this human being. And it becomes clear of who this man Blake is and what he stands for. I mean, look at the, look at this dialogue here. Look at, look at all the, the ING endings that are, that are cut off. Cause you're talking about, what are you talking? So that kind of tells you one thing, right? He's, he's like a New Yorker, right? He's like a fast talking New York guy, you know, like it, it, it tells you about where they live and what kind of vocabulary these guys have. Coffee's for closes only, right? So it has, yeah, there's a little typo there. This is from, uh, this is once again, one of, one of the, um, a little transcript that I found online. Um, you'll find these little, these little um, imperfections in here, here and there. But you see, and anytime he says, he doesn't say because, he says, you certainly don't, pal, because the good news is you're fired, right? Like that's, that's just supposed to be spoken with an accent. It's supposed to be spoken with a, a dialect of some kind. Um, he's a rough writer, right? He has a foul mouth. He's like a sailor. He's, he's not coddling these guys and he's, he's kind of treating them badly. More than that, he is giving the actor, David Mamet, the playwright here, is giving the actor an objective just by the writing, just by looking at the writing, if you're an actor and looking at this like an explorer, you're saying, okay, what does he want? What does he want? Let's talk about something important. Are they all here? Well, I'm going anyway. Let's talk about something important, right? He's trying to, he's like alienating them and making them feel stupid and foolish. That's an objective. That's something, if you're reading this for the first time as an actor, you're going, oh, goody. This, this seems like a fun part for me to play. Um, and so this is, this is chock full of character and choices for you to make. You can, you can build a character through objectives, through super objectives, through actions, given circumstances and the magic. If that one thing that we can place ourselves in this character, right? Um, great. I mean, look at this, look how, look how much he talks. Like he's just, He's such a windbag. He he can't he can't stop sp talking. And the other characters that are trying to get a word in have one or two things to say, and then he goes off. He's a very confident speaker. He's a salesman. They're all salesmen, but he is like the salesman's salesman. And that's important for you to know if you're an actor looking at this for the first time. A I D A attention, interest, decision. Do I have your attention? Interest. Are you interested? I know you are because it's. Oh, walk, right? So he's, he's very persuasive. He's charismatic. He's, he's got like all of these beats, like he's, he's rehearsed this, right? Like he's rehearsed this. He's given this to several people before them. So I drove an $80,000 BMW. That's my name, right? He, he's demeaning. He's, he's putting them in their place. He's like top dogging, right? Really alpha male in this situation, which is really fun to play. And it's really interesting to watch. Um, yeah, cruel, cruel, but that's what theater is. That's what theater and, and, and movies are. They're, they're not about happy go lucky, peaceful people. They're about messy people. Um, 
something's got to go wrong along the way. Even if it's a comedy, even if it's a romantic comedy, you know, those beats, someone's got to get, someone's got to break up. Where's the breakup going to happen? Yeah. In this particular drama, like the, the stakes, the word state, you know, like what I'm, when I'm referred to, when I say stakes, it, it means like the, the, the things that matter that goes up, right? It's like life or death. The situation starts, starts ratcheting. So let's talk about in your book that speaks about two types of theater limitations. The first type of theater lim limitation is space. And the second limitation is time. So let's, let's pretend like we're a playwright and we're commissioned to write a play for a theater. And the theater has 77 seats like here at the Wayward Artist in Santa Ana, California. Um, this is a very small, intimate space. What kind of play would you write for the space? If you're commissioned to write a play for this, what, what would you want to see? Kind of like in a small, intimate drama between a family. You don't want to have too many characters in this. You want to have, you know, max, maybe five characters will come out. It's got a tiny backstage and the people here are all going to be wall to wall packed together, shoulder to shoulder. Um, by the way, not, not really this, this, this theater is not even discussing opening right now. This is my theater company in Santa Ana right now with COVID. It's just like a, it's like a Petri dish in there. So we'll see when we get back to, when we get back to um, normal life, when we can get people back in there. What kind of plays we'll be producing in the future. Um, so that's space. We want to consider the space. One, if it's like a big proscenium space, right, guys? We want to write a big musical or, or a Greek drama or something like that um, with lots of characters, lots of big moments, maybe an explosion here and there. I'm just kidding. Something like that, like some kind of action, some kind of spectacle that's going to pop. Um, in a smaller space, we want to make sure that we take that into account. Small cast, uh, intimate, maybe some... Um, some slow burning action so that the, so that the audience can be right there. They can be right next to the actors. They can see the emotion in their face. You want to take advantage of that kind of stuff. Um, also, you got to think about whether you're writing for the theater or, or film and television, just in general, if you're writing for film and television, uh, your limits are pretty much non-existent in terms of space. Um, you could, you could film outdoors, you could film indoors, you can film in multiple locations. But if you're in a theater, if you're writing a play, then you really have to consider writing for one location because there's only so many things, so many times that you can change locations or change um, the venue. It's, it's always just easier if you're a playwright writing for the theater to keep it all in one space so that you don't have to change that location too many times. Make sense? Uh, your second limitation is time, obviously. Um, if I were to tell you guys that the play that you're gonna go see uh, or a Midsummer Night's Dream is four hours long, how would you feel about that? I can just feel all of you just shaking your head and crying softly to yourselves. Um, so why is that? Like, why do we care so much about that? Like. We've binged Netflix versions um, of five hour long episodes or something like that. We've, we've watched more than five hours of, of Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever. So why is it that when we talk about seeing a play, being there in person, we can really only take two and a half hours? That's essentially the, the attention span of being in company, being in around other people and not in our preferred location that starts to grate on us after two and a half hours. So you got to keep that in mind when you're writing a play, keep it under two and a half hours. If it's a musical, maybe you can push it to like about three hours. <clears throat> Even then it starts getting a little tedious. And if it's a, if it's a really draw, like a heavy drama or something like that, then you want to keep those shorter. Right. Makes sense. So time, you got to think about the time. You got to think about time of day. Is, it, is this play going to take place two hour, two and a half hours of the day? And is it just going to go straight through the day? Or are you going to have some kind of time lapse? Are you going to have to go back in time or go forward in time? 
and um, talk about those kind of things. So these are just two of two theater limitations you have to keep in mind when you're a writer. Yeah. Especially when you're writing for the theater, when you're writing for film and television, these don't matter as much, but in theater they do. Here's some terms in your book that I want you guys to remember. These will be on the test. Once again, uh, that word plot, this is uh, the series of events or the selection or order of the scenes in a play, right? They're the order. It's, it's, so you take a play and you, you measure it in little tiny scenes. The plot is how you arrange those scenes, how you're going to say, okay, grandma meets grandpa in scene one. Grandma kills grandpa in scene two, right? Like, so you kind of go on, so on, so forth through that way. That's called a plot, the arrangement of the scenes. Okay, I want you guys to remember that. An obstacle. What's an obstacle? An obstacle is what your protagonist and antagonist goes through. So let's define those two terms for you as well. The protagonist is your main character or the player of the first part. It's the Greek, that's what the Greek term is that's where it comes from. It comes from ancient Greece. And the protagonist is the player of the first part. And the antagonist means their opposition, his or her hers opposition, right? So th we don't use the terms good guys and bad guys because that's subjective and that doesn't exist. Good and bad is there are total subjective terms, but your antagonist can do bad things. It can, they can do good things. And your protagonist can be a terrible person, <laughs> right? Uh, if you guys know the show Breaking Bad, the protagonist is Walter White, and he is the worst person in that show. So don't think of it as good and bad. You guys got to stop thinking in those black and white terms. Um, start thinking about your protagonist and antagonist as the player of the first part, which most often means the first character that you see, the first one that you go on the journey with and that we follow, and then the antagonist who is their main opposition. And it usually, it, it, this is all just different structures, right? You don't have to have one protagonist. You don't have to have just one antagonist. There can be many different obstacles for your protagonist to go through. So an obstacle can be either a physical or a psychological barrier that your protagonist can't overcome or is trying to overcome. Um, I want you to remember that, right? The physical or psychological barrier. That's what an obstacle means that your protagonist has to overcome. A crisis or a crisis is um, a moment of action. It's an extraordinary event. It's a special event um, where it's a moment of, of choice for your character, for your characters of the play. Um, there's a moment in every play where your protagonist or your, your main characters of some kind have to make choices. And that moment is called a crisis. Um, we'll, we'll see in just a second, we'll show you a little pyramid that shows you um, crisis and, and falling and rising action and stuff like that. And then we get to what's called the climax. And the climax is the, is the most important and significant crisis of the play, okay? And that usually occurs somewhere between the middle to the to near the end of the play or or movie or whatever you're watching, right? So it, it's usually around that middle halfway into the end, middle end portion of of your moment, because we have to have a moment of them falling down and finding a new a new normal to their life. But that climax is is a moment of release. It's it's a moment of of all of the conflict, all of the obstacles have led to this moment and then we have a moment of release, right? So this is the Pixar strategy um, written by uh, the Disney Pixar company. And um, they, they, they refer to the protagonist as the main, the main player or the main character, the, um, the main character, MC, they'll, they'll put it in here. And then they have MPPs, which is major plot points. Right. So uh, once upon a time, we start out with here is a normal, normal life. So if you wanted to write your character as, oh, here I, this person's just going on their daily routine. And all of a sudden they come to this little, this little bump right here, which is called a crisis. Right. And this is the first major plot point as the Pixar strategy um, highlights it. This is also known as a crisis. And then they go on to something called rising action. 
and they go on this little journey. So um, Marty McFly goes and finds Doc Brown and he realizes that he made a time machine, right? And then he's going on this, this journey until one day, right? Every day until one day he finds that, uh, that time machine and then something happens and it kind of drastically changes his life and it goes on that because of that. This happens, a major twist or a dilemma keeps those readers or those performers interested. And because of that, it goes on in a different direction. We're forced to come up here and then we get to this point right here and we got, we got the climax. That's the climax right about here, right? Till we finally get to there and then we have this falling action right here. And then we finally get to a new normal. That's what they don't tell you. This is, there's another page to this that says there's a new normal, there's a new way of life and your protagonist or your main, your main character, your MC has a different way of life and they have, they've changed forever, right? So you can see this is, this is just a basic three act structure, beginning and middle and an end, right? And there we have it. I told you it wouldn't take too long. Um, here's your assignment. This is going to be on, on Canvas as well. I want you guys to imagine um, that you were asked to write a play for a, for a specific theater company about your life, your family's life, or another family, or someone, just any, any stranger, anybody you want. Um, are there strongly opposed forces? I want you to determine that almost first. I want you to think of that very first... Um, Think about who is in the way, right? Think about your family or a, a stranger who has something, who's going through something. What is preventing them from getting what they want? Find that opposed force. Is there conflict? And if there isn't, create some. Create some imaginary conflict. Make it life or death. Make it crazy. Get out there. Don't make this a safe story. What are the obstacles? Would there be a climactic moment? You don't necessarily have to build one and you don't have to write a whole play here, um, but I want you to figure out what would eventually happen. What would happen later on in the play? What point of view would you take? What, what point of view would the audience want? Are they gonna sympathize with your character or are they, are they gonna go, ah, screw that person, they're the worst, you know? So think about, think about all of those things and then I want you to write a paragraph plot with obstacles, moments of crisis, and a climax. And then, in addition to this, I want you to write an opening scene to this play. Make it three to four pages long, and I want you to use at least two characters so that they have some dialogue with each other. Make it like an actor would be really excited to perform this scene. And then go ahead and upload it to Canvas. It's not gonna be that hard. In fact, this is gonna be a really fun assignment. I've I've had so many students approach me afterwards saying like, I'm really interested in writing more after this because they never really had an idea of what it meant to create a story. It almost, it's like pure creation, right? So um, go ahead and have fun with this. If you guys have any questions, you can always email me and uh, think brave, be brave, put your characters through the ringer and they'll be okay, right? They're all in your mind anyway. So um, entertain me. I can't wait to read them and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.